came from God the world to save. I brought them wisdom from above that earth may swallow up my shame. Alistair Crowley, the man who summoned a demon during a desert ritual in Algeria. In this video, we are going to dive into the horribly dark truths about Alistair Crowley. What will be discussed in this video, some viewers may find disturbing, so viewers' discretion is advised. Alistair Crowley was born on October 12, 1875, in Royal Leamington Spa, Warwickshire, England. His full name at birth was Edward Alexander Crowley. Crowley's family was part of the Plymouth Brethren, a strict evangelical Christian movement. His father, Edward Crowley, was a successful brewer who had retired before Alistair was born, dedicating his life to the Plymouth Brethren and preaching as an itinerant minister. Alistair's mother, Emily Bertha Bishop, was deeply religious and adhered to the strict moral codes of the Brethren. From an early age, Crowley was immersed in a highly religious environment. His father would read from the Bible every day after breakfast, and young Alistair was expected to adhere to the stringent moral expectations of the Plymouth Brethren. Crowley later wrote about his father with a mix of admiration and resentment, saying, my father was a Plymouth brother, and in my opinion, a fanatic and an extremist. He was a saint, but he was a saint of such a narrow and bigoted type that he was almost more of a sinner. Alistair Crowley's childhood was marked by both privilege and strict religious discipline. His father's devotion to the Plymouth Brethren's teachings and his successful business ventures provided the family with a comfortable living which allowed Alistair access to quality education. Crowley attended Malvern College and Tunbridge School, both prestigious institutions that were expected to mold him into a respectable young man. However, Crowley's experiences at these schools were far from ideal. He often found himself at odds with the rigid structures and conservative values that mirrored his home life. At Malvern, he was introduced to the natural sciences, which sparked his lifelong interest in the occult and mystical realms. Crowley's intelligence was evident, but his rebellious nature began to surface during these formative years. In 1895, Crowley entered Trinity College, Cambridge, to study moral science, but he soon switched to English literature. His time at Cambridge was a turning point. Freed from the suffocating religious atmosphere of his upbringing, Crowley indulged in various pleasures that were previously forbidden. He took up poetry and mountain climbing, two passions that would remain with him throughout his life. He also began to explore his sexuality, having relationships with both men and women, which was scandalous for the time. During his years at Cambridge, Crowley's rebellion against his religious upbringing became more pronounced. He rejected the Christian faith entirely and embraced a hedonistic lifestyle, driven by his quest for spiritual and personal liberation. This period was marked by a significant intellectual and emotional transformation as he sought to break free from the constraints imposed by his family's strict religious beliefs. Crowley later reflected on this period with a sense of liberation and defiance, stating, I was in the bonds of slavery. I broke those bonds. I declared for the first time that I would be lord of my own soul, that I would follow my own way, irrespective of the previous conventions and customs of the world. This declaration marked the beginning of Crowley's journey into the esoteric and occult, laying the foundation for the radical philosophies and practices he would later develop. Alistair Crowley's introduction to the occult began during his formative years, driven by a deep curiosity and an inherent desire to explore the unknown. His early interests and influences were eclectic, drawing from various sources that ranged from classical literature to Eastern philosophies. As a young man, Crowley was particularly captivated by the works of mystics and esoteric thinkers, which he discovered in the extensive libraries of the schools he attended. One of Crowley's earliest encounters with mysticism came through reading the works of the poet and mystic Percy Bysshe Shelley. Shelley's emphasis on individualism and his disdain for conventional religious practices resonated deeply with Crowley, who found in Shelley a kindred spirit. Additionally, the writings of John Milton, particularly Paradise Lost, influenced Crowley's developing worldview, highlighting themes of rebellion and the quest for knowledge. Crowley's fascination with the mystical and the esoteric intensified during his time at Trinity College, Cambridge. It was here that he began to delve into more specialized occult literature, exploring works on alchemy, magic, and Kabbalah. He voraciously read the writings of Eliphas Levy, a 19th century French occult author whose books on ceremonial magic and the Kabbalistic tradition laid the groundwork for Crowley's own magical practices. 
Levi's concept of magic as the science and art of causing change to occur in conformity with will became a cornerstone of Crowley's later teachings. In 1898, Alistair Crowley's burgeoning interest in the occult led him to join the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, an influential and secretive society dedicated to the study and practice of the occult, metaphysics, and paranormal activities. The Golden Dawn was founded in 1888 by three British Freemasons, William Robert Woodman, William Wynne Westcott, and Samuel Liddell McGregor Mathers. The order quickly became a central hub for those interested in the Western esoteric tradition. Crowley was introduced to the Golden Dawn by Julian Baker, a chemist and fellow mystic. Upon joining, he took the magical name Perdurabo, meaning I shall endure to the end. His initiation into the order marked the beginning of a significant chapter in his life, immersing him in the study and practice of ceremonial magic. Within the Golden Dawn, Crowley met several key figures who profoundly influenced his spiritual and magical development. Samuel Liddell McGregor Mathers, one of the order's founders and its leading figure at the time, became Crowley's mentor. Mathers was a skilled magician and scholar, and he introduced Crowley to the complex rituals and symbolic language of the order. Under Mather's guidance, Crowley learned to perform intricate ceremonies designed to invoke spiritual beings, harness magical forces, and achieve personal transformation. Another important figure in Crowley's early occult education was Alan Bennett, a senior member of the Golden Dawn known for his expertise in Eastern mysticism and practical magic. Bennett, who later became a Buddhist monk, taught Crowley the fundamentals of meditation, inchen, and the use of magical tools. Crowley admired Bennett's ascetic lifestyle and his deep knowledge of both Western and Eastern esoteric traditions. Reflecting on his time with Bennett, Crowley wrote, he was the noblest and gentlest soul I have ever known, and in his presence, I learned the true meaning of the word master. Crowley's initial practices and experiences within the Golden Dawn were transformative. He quickly advanced through the Order's ranks, demonstrating a remarkable aptitude for both theoretical knowledge and practical magic. His dedication to the craft and his willingness to experiment with new techniques set him apart from many of his peers. During this period, Crowley also began to formulate his own ideas about magic and mysticism, laying the groundwork for his future contributions to the occult. Crowley's time with the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn was not without controversy. His abrasive personality and unorthodox methods often clashed with other members, leading to internal conflicts and power struggles. Despite these challenges, Crowley's experiences with the Golden Dawn were instrumental in shaping his approach to magic and establishing his reputation as a formidable occultist. The pivotal moment in Alistair Crowley's life came in 1904 during his stay in Cairo, Egypt. Crowley and his wife, Rose Edith Kelly, embarked on a honeymoon that would lead to one of the most significant spiritual revelations of his life. In March of that year, while residing in Cairo, Rose began to exhibit what Crowley described as a form of spiritual trance. She insisted that, they are waiting for you, referring to some unseen mystical force. Intrigued and somewhat skeptical, Crowley followed her guidance. On April 8, 9 and 10, 1904, Crowley experienced a series of extraordinary events that culminated in the reception of a mystical text known as the Book of the Law, Liber Alvel Legis. According to Crowley, the book was dictated to him by a non-corporeal entity named Iwas, who identified himself as the messenger of Horus, the Egyptian god of the sky and kingship. Crowley described Iwas as a being of vast intelligence and power, whose presence he could sense distinctly during the dictation process. The circumstances surrounding the revelation were both eerie and profound. Crowley recounted how he sat in his room at the Great Pyramid Hotel in Cairo with pen and paper while an overpowering voice spoke to him. He later wrote, I was to listen and write down what I heard. No more. I was given a mandate to proclaim a new law to mankind. Over the course of three days, Crowley transcribed the text that would become the Book of the Law a work that laid the foundation for his new religious philosophy, Thelema. The Book of the Law introduced several core principles that would define Thelema. The most famous and central tenet is encapsulated in the phrase, 
do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. This statement emphasizes the importance of discovering and following one's true purpose or true will, a concept that Crowley believed to be the divine and unique path each individual is meant to follow. He argued that adhering to one's true will was the key to spiritual fulfillment and personal liberation. Another essential principle of Thelema is expressed in the aphorism, love is the law, love under will. This phrase signifies that love, in its purest form, is an expression of the true will. Crowley elaborated on this by explaining that true love is a force that operates harmoniously with one's true will, and it should guide all actions and interactions. The interplay between love and will is fundamental to the practice of Thelema, encouraging individuals to act in ways that are both loving and aligned with their divine purpose. The role of the individual's true will is central to Thelema, Crowley taught that each person has a unique purpose that they are meant to fulfill, and discovering this purpose requires deep self-exploration and spiritual discipline. He believed that societal norms, religious dogmas, and external expectations often obscure one's true will, and thus the path to enlightenment involves shedding these external influences and embracing one's inner calling. Crowley stated, every man and every woman is a star, implying that each person is a unique and vital component of the cosmos, with their own orbit and path to follow. In the Book of the Law, Crowley received instructions on how to spread the message of Thelema and guide others in discovering their true will. The text is composed of three chapters, each delivered by a different deity. Nui, the goddess of the night sky, Hadit, the winged serpent representing the core of every individual, and Ra Horquit, a form of the Egyptian god Horus, symbolizing a new era of spiritual enlightenment. These deities collectively articulate the principles and practices of Thelema, providing a framework for both personal and spiritual transformation. Crowley's revelation of the Book of the Law and the subsequent development of Thelema marked a significant departure from traditional religious doctrines. He viewed Thelema not merely as a religion, but as a comprehensive philosophy and way of life that emphasized personal freedom, spiritual exploration, and the pursuit of one's true will. This radical approach challenged conventional beliefs and attracted a diverse following of individuals seeking an alternative path to spiritual fulfillment. In 1907, Alistair Crowley founded the AA, which stands for Astrum Argentum, or the Silver Star, an occult order that aimed to advance the principles of Thelema and provide a structured path for spiritual development. The goals of the AA were to promote the enlightenment of individuals through a rigorous program of self-discipline, magical training, and mystical practices. The order was structured hierarchically, with initiates progressing through various grades, each associated with specific magical tasks and spiritual objectives. The structure of the AA was designed to guide members through a process of personal and spiritual transformation. Initiates began at the neophyte grade, and advanced through the ranks by mastering the teachings and practices of each level. Key rituals and teachings of the AA included meditation, ceremonial magic, and the study of sacred texts. Members were required to perform daily rituals, keep detailed magical diaries, and undergo regular examinations by their superiors to ensure their progress. Crowley's emphasis on personal experience and individual discovery set the AA apart from other occult organizations. He believed that each member's journey was unique and that the role of the order was to provide guidance and support rather than impose rigid dogmas. This approach reflected Thelema's core principle of discovering and following one's true will. Crowley's involvement with the Ordo Templi Orientis OTO, a prominent occult order, began in 1910 when he was initiated into its ranks. The OTO was originally founded in Germany in the early 20th century by Karl Kellner and Theodore Royce. With a focus on the study of esoteric knowledge and the practice of sexual magic, the Order's teachings were based on a blend of Eastern and Western mystical traditions, including elements of Freemasonry, Kabbalah, and alchemy. In 1912, Crowley was appointed as the head of the British branch of the OTO by Theodore Reuss. Recognizing the compatibility of Thelema with the Order's existing teachings, Crowley began to integrate Thelemic principles into the OTO's rituals and doctrines. He rewrote many of the Order's rituals to reflect Thelemic concepts, emphasizing the importance of individual will 
and spiritual freedom. One of Crowley's key contributions to the OTO was the development of the Gnostic Mass, a central ritual that celebrated the principles of Thelema through symbolic enactments and invocations. The Gnostic Mass became a cornerstone of OTO practice and remains a significant ritual in Thelemic communities today. Under Crowley's leadership, the OTO expanded its influence and attracted a diverse following of individuals seeking a path to spiritual enlightenment through the principles of Thelema. In 1920, Crowley established the Abbey of Thelema in Cephalu, Sicily, as a communal retreat for the practice and study of Thelemic principles. The purpose of the Abbey was to create an environment where residents could live according to the laws of Thelema, free from the constraints of conventional society. Crowley envisioned the Abbey as a spiritual utopia where individuals could explore their true will and engage in magical and mystical practices without external interference. Daily life at the Abbey was structured around a regimen of rituals, meditation and study. Residents were expected to perform daily invocations, maintain detailed magical diaries and participate in communal activities that promoted the principles of Thelema. The walls of the Abbey were adorned with murals painted by Crowley, depicting various symbolic and mystical themes that served as visual aids for meditation and ritual work. Notable members and visitors to the Abbey included Leah Hersig, Crowley's Scarlet Woman and High Priestess, as well as other devoted followers who sought to immerse themselves in the Thelemic way of life. The Abbey attracted a mix of artists, writers and spiritual seekers, all drawn by Crowley's charismatic leadership and the promise of spiritual liberation. However, the Abbey of Thelema was not without controversy. Reports of drug use, sexual rituals and unconventional practices attracted negative attention from the local authorities and the press. Crowley's notoriety as the wickedest man in the world only fueled public suspicion and outrage. The final straw came in 1923, when a young follower, Raoul Loveday, died under mysterious circumstances, leading to accusations of negligence and misconduct. In response to the mounting public pressure and scandal, the Italian authorities ordered the closure of the Abbey and expelled Crowley and his followers from the country. The closure of the Abbey marked the end of one of Crowley's most ambitious projects but it also cemented his legacy as a controversial and influential figure in the world of modern occultism. But now, let us talk about the demon that Crowley summoned. Caronzon, often referred to as the Demon of Dispersion, is a complex and multifaceted entity in the realm of occultism. Historically and mythologically, Caronzon is associated with chaos and the dissolution of order, representing the formless abyss that lies between the material and spiritual worlds. The concept of Chironzon can be traced back to the writings of the Elizabethan Magus John Dee and his scryer Edward Kelly, who first encountered the entity during their Enochian magical workings in the late 16th century. Dee and Kelly described Chironzon as the guardian of the 10th ether, a liminal space that must be navigated to achieve higher spiritual states. Alistair Crowley's interpretation of Chironzon was heavily influenced by his study of Dee and Kelly's Enochian system. Crowley viewed Chironzon as the ultimate challenge for the magician, embodying the chaotic forces that must be confronted and mastered on the path to enlightenment. He believed that Chironzon represented the ego's destructive tendencies and the illusions that bind individuals to the material world. Conquering Chironzon, according to Crowley, was essential for achieving the true will and advancing in spiritual development. One of the most infamous events in Crowley's magical career was the summoning of Coronzon in the desert of Algeria in December 1909. Crowley, accompanied by his disciple Victor Neuberg, undertook this dangerous and elaborate ritual with the intention of confronting and overcoming the demon of dispersion. The ritual took place in the desert near Bu Sa'ada, a remote and desolate area that Crowley believed was ideal for such a profound and potentially perilous magical operation. The isolation of the desert provided the necessary environment for deep concentration and minimized the risk of external disturbances. The preparations for the ritual were meticulous and extensive. Crowley and Neuberg constructed a magical circle and a triangular barrier, following the instructions from Dee and Kelly's Enochian system. The circle was inscribed with protective symbols and names of power to guard against Choronzon's malevolent influence. 
Within the triangle, which was placed outside the circle, Crowley intended to trap the demon during the summoning. Crowley armed himself with magical tools, including a wand and a dagger, and wore ceremonial robes. He also prepared an extensive array of Enochian invocations, chants, and protective prayers. Neuberg, who acted as Crowley's assistant and scribe, was instructed to record every detail of the ritual and to intervene only if absolutely necessary. The summoning of Chironzon began with Crowley performing a series of Enochian invocations to call forth the demon. As the ritual progressed, Crowley entered a trance-like state, channeling the chaotic energy of Chironzon into the triangle. According to Crowley's account, the demon manifested as a formless and ever-changing presence, embodying the very essence of chaos and confusion. During the summoning, Chironzon attempted to breach the protective circle, using a variety of deceptive tactics and psychological manipulations. Crowley described the encounter as a fierce battle of wills, with Chironzon exploiting his deepest fears and doubts. At one point, Chironzon broke free from the triangle and attacked Neuberg, who bravely defended himself with his own magical implements. The ritual culminated in Crowley's successful containment of Choronzon within the triangle, where he forced the demon to reveal its true nature and purpose. Crowley recorded that Choronzon eventually dissolved into a chaotic swirl of energy, signifying his temporary defeat and the restoration of order. The aftermath of the ritual left both Crowley and Neuberg physically and emotionally exhausted. The encounter with Choronzon had tested their resolve and their understanding of the nature of reality. Crowley reflected on the experience in his writings, emphasizing the importance of facing one's inner demons and the chaotic forces within the psyche. He saw the successful summoning and binding of Choronzon as a crucial step in his own spiritual evolution and a testament to the power of Thelemic magic. Crowley's detailed account of the summoning of Choronzon can be found in his Magical Diaries and in his published works, such as The Vision and The Voice. These texts provide a vivid and often dramatic description of the ritual, capturing the intensity and danger of the encounter. Crowley's writings have since become a key source of inspiration and instruction for practitioners of Thelemic and Enochian magic. Interpretations of the Koronzon ritual vary among occult scholars and practitioners. Some view the event as a profound psychological exploration, with Koronzon representing the fragmented aspects of the self that must be integrated to achieve wholeness. Others see it as a literal confrontation with a powerful and malevolent spirit, demonstrating the efficacy and potency of Crowley's magical techniques. In the final years of his life, Alistair Crowley faced numerous health and financial struggles. After the closure of the Abbey of Thelema in Cephalou and his expulsion from Italy, Crowley moved frequently across Europe, often living in poverty. His once considerable inheritance had been squandered on his lavish lifestyle, extensive travels, and his constant pursuit of mystical and magical knowledge. By the late 1920s, Crowley's financial situation had become dire, forcing him to rely on the generosity of his followers and occasional literary works to sustain himself. Crowley's health also began to deteriorate significantly. Years of substance abuse, particularly his addiction to heroin, which he initially used to treat his asthma, took a severe toll on his physical condition. Despite his declining health, Crowley continued to write prolifically, producing numerous books, essays, and articles on magic, mysticism, and his philosophy of Thelema. His works from this period, such as Magic Without Tears and The Book of Thoth, reflect his enduring commitment to teaching and advancing the principles of Thelema. Crowley's continued influence during his later years was marked by his interactions with a new generation of occultists and spiritual seekers. He maintained correspondence with his followers and conducted magical operations, offering guidance and mentorship despite his failing health. His unwavering dedication to his spiritual path and his role as a teacher ensured that his legacy would endure beyond his lifetime. Alistair Crowley passed away on December 1, 1947, at the age of 72, in a boarding house in Hastings, England. His death was relatively quiet, and he was buried in a simple ceremony. Despite the controversies that had surrounded him throughout his life, Crowley's influence on modern occultism and popular culture continued to grow after his death. In the years following his passing, Crowley's reputation underwent a significant transformation. While he had been vilified by the mainstream press and condemned by religious authorities during his lifetime, 
His writings and teachings gained a new level of respect and appreciation among occultists and scholars. Crowley's extensive body of work on magic, mysticism, and the philosophy of Thelema became foundational texts for contemporary occult practices. Alistair Crowley's legacy is evident in his profound impact on contemporary spiritual movements and his enduring presence in media and literature. Thelema, as a spiritual and philosophical system, continues to attract followers worldwide. The principles of do what thou wilt and the pursuit of one's true will resonate with those seeking personal and spiritual liberation. Various occult organizations, including the AA and the Ordo Templi Orientis (OTO), continue to uphold and propagate Crowley's teachings, ensuring that his influence remains strong within the occult community. Crowley's influence extends beyond the realm of esotericism. His ideas and persona have permeated popular culture, inspiring countless artists, writers, and musicians. References to Crowley and his work can be found in literature, film, and music, often highlighting his enigmatic and controversial character. Notable figures in popular culture, such as rock musicians Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin and David Bowie, have openly acknowledged Crowley's impact on their artistic endeavors. In media and literature, Crowley's life and work have been the subject of numerous biographies, documentaries, and fictional portrayals. His complex and often contradictory personality, coupled with his extraordinary contributions to occultism, make him a compelling figure for exploration and analysis. Crowley's own writings, with their rich symbolism and esoteric depth, continue to be studied and interpreted by scholars and practitioners alike.